Hello, I'm Kami Hepner and welcome. Today we're gonna talk about the blendable locations and post-process materials in Unreal. I got some questions about how the blendable locations works in Unreal Fast. Since the pipeline change, there is a big changes to how uh, post-process material works. And that happens because the Epic uh, had to upgrade the pipeline, the rendering pipeline, to basically modernize it and to accommodate the technologies like TSR, which is temporal super uh, resolution, and also TAA, which is a temporal anti-aliasing and all of those cool technologies that let us render our frames in a lower resolution and then upscale them. And we're going to talk about it because all of that influence um, the change in blendable locations and post-process materials. So let's talk what are the blendable locations. If you are new to Unreal, you don't know really, let me just uh, give you a quick uh, info where they are, when to find them. So when you are in Unreal and you open any of your post-process materials and by post-process materials, I mean the material that have a material domain choose as a post-process, that's very important because blendable locations are only for post-process materials. And if you scroll down, you will see here an entry called blendable location. And here we have a few options, okay? We're gonna talk about all of them. First, let's get back to our diagram. What is that diagram? Well, this is a rendering pipeline, very simplified, because the rendering pipeline now is very complicated. Many things happen in parallel. We're gonna talk about it in the future, but now I just wanna show you where the blendable location fits and what they actually do. So what are they? Generally speaking, the blendable locations are, let's call it injection points, where you can inject your material to change a little bit of a rendering steps happening, all right? So what do we have here? Well, when the scene starts rendering, the first thing happens is a translucency and distortion. You can't do about it at this step anything. Then what happens is a scene color before the doff. This is a first like uh, input location where you can change the scene color before being affected by deep of field. So what can you use it for? For example, you can see a deep base uh, color grading. Basically, you wanna you can use it for all the effects that you want it to be affected by the deep of field. That would totally make sense. For example, like changing our colors of an image based on the deep and then that will be affected by the deep of field. There's many options for you there. And the next step happens after the deep of field. So deep of field being applied, now you have a scene color with the deep of field, okay? And this is next point where you can inject your post-process material, okay? What you can use it for? You can use it for rendering lines, outlines, some hatching shaders, maybe um, some color correction after deep of field because you don't want to affect the deep of field. Basically, now you can modify the scene color without it affecting deep of field because it's been applied already. That's really cool. Then we do have a translucency after the deep of field. Well, in Unreal, when we do render a translucency, we have a, there's a few options when the translucency is being applied. And if your material is, that if the translucency in your material for your object is rendered after the deep of field, now you have a chance to modify it. I'm gonna show you some example about that really cool. We're gonna talk about it in the details later. Don't worry about it. Then what happens is the anti-aliasing TSR and TAA. Now, if you have a TSR enabled in your project, you have to remember that all of those first steps happens in a screen resolution, basically in a lower resolution. And then from now on, they're being upscaled and they will happen in a display resolution. We talk about it in the details in a second, all right? Then we have a screen space reflections. You can input your material there. Then we have um, the screen space reflection being applied. Then we have a bloom. We can uh, change the screen color before it goes to the bloom. Then we have a tone mapping. And we talk about the tone mapping section a little bit. We can we can replace the tone mapper. And then you have a final scene color after tone mapping and what you can change with it, all right? So think about the blendable locations as injections points. So here we have a few example materials uh, assigned to different blendable locations. And a scene color before the doff, what you can do, you can do some uh, underwater effect or there is some light leaking between the cracks and you basically effects that you want be to be affected by the deep of field if you have a deep of field enabled in your project or in your post process volume all right now let's say scene color after dove uh, that's happened after deep of field 
And let's say this is a good spot, for example, to do outlines of your objects. And um, also one very important thing to remember that all of these steps before the tone mapping happens in HDR color space, basically they're in a high dynamic range uh, images. They have a lots of information, lots of color information. And then what happens during a tone mapping, they basically uh, being flattened and they goes to the something what we call LDR, low dynamic range, and they being displayed on your monitor. That's very important because if you do some effects with the colors, for example, outlines and things, you have a much more information in your images to work with, okay? You can't really display it on your screen and really see it. Um, there's some ways to debug it, look at like HDR information, etc. but that's out of the scope of this uh, short tutorial. But I just want to show you an example. If we do our outlines just before depot field and when we do the outlines after tone mapping, and there will be a difference between those two, okay? So let me show it to you. So here in Unreal, I do have a very simple uh, post-process material that just drew outlines. And we assign it to our post-process volume. And if you look at the material, uh, you can see that the outlines here in the preview being affected by the bloom. And the reason why it, it, it is not visible in the main scene is that because I disabled the bloom in my post-process volume, okay? So this is also important that if, I, if you're doing outlines here at this blendable uh, location, you have to think about the ways how you can exclude the outlines from the bloom. There's some different ways and techniques to do it, but also you can either disable the bloom or do your outlines after tone mapping, for example, this is another good reason, okay? So here our lines are affected by the bloom, but in my scene I disabled the bloom. But also when you select the post-process material node, you can see here that we do have a, our material applied at the scene color after depot field. Now what's happened when we change it to the after tone mapping? What do, I just want you to notice um, um, many details Hopefully you can see it around the edges of the chairs. You can see some extra lines, white and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, when we change it to scene color after tone mapping, now our material will be applied as the last material in the chain. You can see all of these lines being lost. And there's a due to a few things. First of all, is that we have a less information in a low dynamic range image with a color. And second thing is the tone mapper by itself changes the image. So it's it flattens the color and etc. Cetera, et cetera. It, it applies the curve basically to adjust the color. So that also makes the lines disappear. Okay? So you have to think of what stage you will inject which material. Okay, the next stage where you can inject your material is the translucency after DOF. And you can actually at this stage, you can just modify the translucency. So it's really cool. So you can control how the translucent materials being rendered. Let me show you a very cool example in Unreal. So here I do have a very simple uh, scene. And on this cube, I do have a very simple translucent material. But I also, I have an applied to my post-process volume. I applied a material that it's blendable location, it's set to a translucency after DOF. And I modify some translucency. Yeah, let me just show you what do I do. So now if all the objects behind that cube will be rendered a little bit blur and desaturated. That was the effect that I just want to show it to you. So it lets you to create things like a, a foggy glass, a frosted glass. You can create like underwater particles. Let's say, you know, you have a big pond of water, you want to render some uh, particles under it, some bubbles and etc. You can color refractions. It's, it's very, very, very powerful and very cool effect. The next uh, blendable location I just want to mention is the SSR input. So now we have an option to modify the screen space reflection. And that's amazing because it let us to colorize, for example, the screen space reflection to modify them a little bit. It gives us more artistic freedom. So let me jump in into Unreal and show it to you. So here I have a very simple uh, Unreal scene with screen space reflection. You can see the table reflecting the floor. And I do have a post-process volume with a post-process material on it. When I activate it, you can see the, the reflections changes. They just move and shift and etc. So in my material, the important thing is I do have set the blendable location 
as an SSR input. So basically what you do, you, you're getting the, test, the screen space reflections and you can modify them. That's, that gives us a great artistic freedom. And you can play with it. You can, for example, do some a contrast. You can desaturate your reflection. You can just animate them a little bit. Do quite a bit with that. You know, you can uh, remove some objects from the screen space reflections by using some mask and etc. So there is, a, there is a quite a bit of artistic freedom with that. The next step diagram is the scene color before the bloom. So what happening here, you can actually modify the high dynamic range image and by changing the colors, you can modify how the bloom will be applied. So you can push some highlights, you can just reduce some highlights, you can colorize some highlights, you can apply some masks and etc. So uh, this is very cool, powerful stage to remember that everything from now on the scene color will be affected uh, by the bloom. Okay. Oh, I just want to mention about the scene color before the bloom. One of the very cool effects, you can basically um, apply some uh, screen distortion to create like a heat effect, and that will be affected by the bloom. You will get a completely different look by applying it before the bloom and applying it as scene color after tone mapping. So, so this is a very cool stage to create some like a, a heat effects uh, coming from some heat sources, like a flame or like a charcoal and etc. okay? And next step is a replacing a tone mapper. Speaking of the tone mapping, replacing tone mapper is quite advanced topic. Some people want to jump on it and do it, but I just want to tell you that in Unreal now you have a quite powerful grading tool. So if you, I'm recommending you to look at how to grade your scene in Unreal so you can do quite a bit with the standard grading tools in Unreal. Where replacing tone mapper, it is an option. Uh, but you still can do quite a lot just with using normal color grading tools in Unreal in your post-process volume. And then the tone mapping happened. And generally speaking, the tone mapping, what it does, it basically takes the high dynamic range image and converts it to the low dynamic range. So it clips the colors and everything basically in a way that can be displayed on your monitor. All that information can be displayed on your monitor. Uh, you will expect about lots of information being lost at that at that step and then at the end after everything you can apply some effects you can uh, basically have a sync color and you can and this location sync color after tone mapping you can still colorize it you can apply some texture you can apply some noise vignetting um whatever you want right remember one thing that after tsr all of these steps from here from anti-aliasing will be happening in the display play resolution. So all of those will be happening in a high resolution if you have a TSR enabled, okay? We'll get back to it in a second. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is the order of execution of those uh, blendable locations, okay? So you can't change the order of executions of those steps because they're in a pipeline and that's how it is. Now, if you would like your material, as you, as you know in Unreal, right? If we go back to the Unreal, let's just get back very quickly. Here I have a material. And if I add another material here, let's just do add some lines. It's going to completely break the rendering, doesn't matter. And I'm going to add another one. And let's say post process, hue shift, doesn't matter. And now when I'm changing an order, nothing really changes. Why is that? That's a very good question. I want you also think about the blendable locations as kind of like a type of a materials, okay? So these materials using this blendable location are kind of materials of this one type, okay? So here we see like these two materials are one type, these materials are one type, for example, scene color after tone mapping, those two materials are one type. And when we do have a priority settings, even if the next material after it has a higher priority, it wouldn't be executed. So these two will be executed first, and then this one will be executed, even if it has a higher priority. And what I mean by priority? If you look in your Unreal and you select any of the materials, you have a blendable priority. And what you can do, you can basically change at what stage the material will be executed only between the materials of the same type. That's extremely important. So one way to change the execution order is to move the materials on your array list, 
But another way you can do it in your material by choosing the blendable priority. The higher the number, the earlier material will be executed. So for example, if I have an outline's priority set to three, that doesn't mean the outlines will be executed before those two materials. Why? Because their blendable location is a scene color before the deep of field. So they will be executed first. Now, if I change the priority between those two materials, yes, then the priority will change between them because they're the same type. That's extremely important to remember. The last thing I just want to mention here is that if you have a temporal super uh, resolution enabling your project, all of these frames are rendered in a lower resolution. Then they will be upscaled to your screen, to your display resolution, your window resolution. Why it's important? It's important because if you apply any textures, you have to understanding that here they will be applied in a lower resolution. Also for optimization purposes of your effects, depends what you're doing. If your effect is very pixel heavy, doing it at a lower resolution will be better than doing it at the display resolution as well. You have to decide it where you're going to inject your materials. Now it's a little bit more complicated. So when you're working on your scene, on your game, final look will be combination of few materials. It's not just one master material that you're going to do everything. There will be a few materials during different steps. You have to think like that. You have a one material adjusting a little bit of a colors at different stage. One material adjusting colors at a different stage, uh, one material drawing outlines, and etc. etc. So there will be no one master material doing everything. Um, you will probably have a few materials doing different steps. So try to break them down, depends on where you would like to inject it. Now, and the last thing I just want to say, you can download a PDF from my coffee page when you have uh, all the information about the blendable locations. Uh, put together in a nice PDF with that diagram so it's easy to refer back. So thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, let me know and good luck with your renderings.